Welcome to the Miles to Go Drug Education video series. This is the introduction. And we make this intro video for you so you have at least a little bit of an idea of who we are and why it is that we actually ended up becoming drug educators. When you talk to people as adults, you'll find many times that who they are as an adult has a lot to do with who they were as a kid. Now, when you look at my life from the outside as a kid, it looks like I was actually pretty happy. I mean, I was a really cute kid. Granted, there were some questions about my actual level of sanity, but still, I was a real cutie. One of the things that had a lot of influence over me when I was young, though, is the fact that my dad was in the Navy and my mom was a nurse. Now, when I say my dad was in the Navy, that had a lot of different layers. First of all, he was in the nuclear submarine service, which meant that every six months, he was gone for three of them. When he would leave, he'd leave for 90 days. And for most of that time, he was completely out of communication because they would go below the surface of the sea and they would not come up for 60 days minimum. And so I didn't have a lot of contact with my dad during that period of time. And it made me feel really lonely. If you had asked me as a kid, what's an emotion, I would have said sad, lonely, afraid. Now, another thing about my dad's naval service was the fact that we moved all the time. By the time I was 19 years old, I believe I had lived in 17 different houses. And when that's your lifestyle, one of the things you have to realize is you're always the new kid in class. And being the new kid, while it provides a really open-ended opportunity to develop new relationships, for me, it was just awful because I was constantly the kid who didn't have a social structure. I didn't have good mm -hmm. friends. I didn't have best friends. I just had people that I met and then people that I lost. And it really had a lot to do with how I develop my skills at integrating into a group. How do you get into a group? For me, I had to do it fast. And one of the things that I used a lot of times to integrate quickly was substance use. And that has a lot to do with why I started smoking when I was eight years old. Now, you might be horrified by that, but the fact is, when I was eight years old, we lived in Charleston, South Carolina. My dad was stationed at Charleston Naval Shipyard. And when I was eight years old, the year was 1964. And in 1964, half the adult population of South Carolina smoked. It was a deeply entrenched tobacco society. And so it was actually kind of normal for a kid in that climate to use tobacco. Military people tend to smoke at extremely high rates compared to normal society as well. And so for me, tobacco was ubiquitous. But also, in third grade, the oldest kid in my class, the coolest kid in my class, his name was Clifford. And one day, Clifford said, we're going over to my garage to smoke cigarettes, do you want to come? Now, I got two choices. At that point, if I say yes, then I'm one of Clifford's boys. I actually get to be a part of this really cool group of guys. Now, if I say no, these guys are going to tease me mercilessly. And so, really, I didn't even see it as a choice. I said yes. And so, at the age of eight, I started smoking tobacco. At the age of 12, I was drinking. By the age of 14, I was smoking weed. And if you think back again, what motivates people to become the adults that they are, a lot of it has to do with self-image. And for me, if you look at this picture, first thing I want you to notice is look at my feet. I mean, they're monstrously big. And that's only part of the problem that I had at that point with my self-image. I was a really clumsy, goofy guy. And one of my students actually drew a picture of me, how I saw myself when I was 13 years old. Now, when I was 13, you know, of course, I'm going through puberty. That's where, you gr where your body grows to full adult size. Unfortunately, it never does so proportionally. It does so one body part at a time. And so the first thing my body decided to do was grow these monstrous feet. The other thing that happens to you when you're 13 years old as a male is you develop this male voice box. And it's really cool to have that deep voice. Unfortunately, when you're 13, you're driving that voice box with a 13-year-old brain. And so if you go to a seventh grade dance, you see all the boys on one side of the room and all the girls on the other side of the room. Finally, one brave male soul ventures out of the pack. He walks over to the girls and he's like, hey, baby, you want to uh, dance? And right when you need your voice to be as low as possible, you sound like Casper on steroids. And that's kind of a problem because the girls find that hilariously entertaining. And of course, I found it really embarrassing. The other thing that was going on with me when I was 13 years old was I had, this, I had a head the size of an orange and a nose the size of a banana. I had this massive beak hanging off the front of my head. Now, really, a reality check would indicate it wasn't actually that big. And yet to me, when I looked in the mirror at 13... 
this is what I saw. And so I had this huge nose hanging off the front of my face as well. Now, again, my father was in the Navy, and he was also my hairstylist. Now, back in the 60s and early 70s, hair down to the middle of your back was cool. Actually, what my father did was cut all my hair off. And so he he did marine-style haircuts, just buzzed all my hair off. And so I had that going against me as well. Finally, what's the last indignity our faces suffer at the age of 13? Of course, acne. And I didn't want my zits to be lonely, so I grew a whole crop of them. So here I stand, tiny little bald-headed, big-nosed, zit-faced, funny-voiced, duck-footed loser, how do you think I did socially? And so how, what does this have to do with me drinking at the age of 12? Well, I get invited to a party. And after about 20 minutes of standing at this party, I realize there's no adults around. And if I want to take enough risks and break enough rules, I can steal some of that beer that's in that refrigerator across the room. So two friends and I stole a six pack of Budweiser. We snuck it into the garage and we each drank two beers. Now, that might not sound like a really large dose of alcohol, and it's not, unless you're 12 and you've never had a drink before and your stomach is empty. So what happened is this, the alcohol almost immediately transitions into my bloodstream. About six minutes on an empty stomach, alcohol will be in your bloodstream. About 20 minutes later, I'm standing out in that party, and alcohol is actually a pretty predictable drug. It's, it has a predictable cascade of events. One of the first things it does is removes fear. So when you hear the nickname liquid courage said about alcohol, that's why it removes your fear. And so I'm back in that party and I'm not feeling as afraid anymore. I'm not feeling as self-conscious anymore. And so I asked your girl to dance and she said yes. And in my mind, it became immediately apparent beer was a magic potion. Now, if you're confused by my message here, I'm not trying to say, hey, if you feel some social anxiety, get hammered. It goes away. That's not my point. My point is this, when I found alcohol helped me socialize and quickly integrated me into a social structure of which I was almost always an outsider, I used it as a tool. And once you show a human brain an easier way to get a job done, it's really hard to convince that brain to go back and do it the hard way. And so I used alcohol almost every single time I socialized. Why wouldn't I? It was easier than learning how to have the skill. And so I started drinking at 12 and I started smoking weed at 14. And all of these things had really big impacts on me. And eventually, by the time I was a junior in high school, the really cute kid didn't look the same anymore. You know, that's me in the background with the arrow pointing at my head, and that's the cigarette hanging out of my face that I've now been smoking for nine years, and I've been drinking for at least five years here. I've been smoking weed for three, and when you look at this picture, you might want to prejudge really quickly about what we look like. We kind of look like a pack of thugs. Actually, what this is, is this is the Student Advisory Council in my high school in 1973. This is the student government. This is our yearbook picture. And when you look at the picture, you might not understand that at this point, I'm getting relatively good grades in high school. I'm on the track team as a pole vaulter. I have a full-time job after school and on weekends. Because remember, my dad was in the Navy, and he had five kids. If you wanted something in my family, you bought it for yourself. He wasn't giving you any money. So I wanted to buy a car, and I got a job to buy that car. When I bought this really cool Triumph GT6 Mark III, it was the coolest car in my whole high school. I drove it to school every single day. I picked up my beautiful girlfriend, Marcy, on the way. I got accepted to every college I applied to, and my mom loved me. So when you look at this picture, you might think, wow, what a thug. Actually, I was a pretty, I was a pretty successful high school student. Unfortunately, when you look at the background issues, though, I've been smoking, drinking, and smoking weed for quite a long time. I always ask my students in the classroom, if you could magically transport yourself back to this moment right here and say to me, you should stop using drugs, they're bad for you, would I stop? And I wouldn't. Because here's the thing, my life looked really functional at that point. You didn't have a lot of ammo to convince me I should stop using. I'm getting good grades, I'm, a, I'm an athlete, I have a really good work ethic, I have a beautiful girlfriend, I have a nice car, I have a future, I'm going to college, and it doesn't look like they're doing anything bad to me. And that's kind of the confusion a lot of times students experience when they get drug education, is people come in and they tell them all these horror stories about what's going to happen to them if they use or if they drink. And when they go to a party on the weekend and see people doing that stuff, it doesn't really look like they're destroyed at the end of that. And that can be really confusing. They've been told that all this horrible stuff is going to happen to them. And when they see people do that stuff, it doesn't happen. So that's the problem I faced was there was not a lot of evidence to tell me to stop. 
when I got to college, things started to progress even more rapidly. Yeah, that's me with the beer can in one hand and the cigarette in the other hand. But look at my facial expression and tell me you're going to talk this kid out of drinking. You're not. This is my freshman year of college, first semester, and I'm still pretty much convinced that this stuff doesn't have any repercussions or costs. Four years later, if I had any brains in my head, I might have been able to figure out things were going wrong. And yet at that point, I was heavily addicted to alcohol. I was addicted to marijuana. I had starting use. I had started using cocaine heavily. I was addicted to tobacco. And by the time I got kicked out of college, yes, kicked out, not failed out. I got kicked out. When I got kicked out of college, I was really in trouble with my addiction. But I still didn't see it. And I still didn't really care. I got a job waiting tables. From that waiting job, I got offered a job with a Fortune 500 company. And when I was 25 years old, I was making really good money. We're talking lots of money. New house, two new cars, married my college sweetheart. When you look at me from the outside, I look like the American success story. What I am on the inside, unfortunately, is an alcoholic and a drug addict. And by the age of 30, I, I was dying. Not poetically speaking, not metaphorically speaking, I was dying. And if I didn't check into drug rehab at the age of 30, I wouldn't be here today. They told me, here's why you use like you do. Here's why you fail every time you try and stop on your own. Here's a couple things you might want to try. They might save your life. And drug education to me is essentially why I'm alive. And so that's really why I do drug education today. It has a lot to do with who I was as a kid and who I became as an adult, an alcoholic and drug addict. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us today. If I have a chance to see you in the classroom, I look forward to that. If I don't, join us again for the next video in our series.